Welcome to the 34th meetup of the Data on Kubernetes community. This is our second meetup this week. And actually, interestingly enough, on Tuesday, we were talking about some stuff related to observability with Alex uh, Jones, who's an SRE working at JP Morgan. Um, but today we're joined by Sebastian Paul. Just want to remind everybody, uh, Gorka, can we get the links on the screen? If you're new to the Data on Kubernetes, Kubernetes community, we're on Slack, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. We're always looking for, for new speakers. I was lucky enough to find Sebastian, uh, contact him on LinkedIn, he responded, and here we are today. Um, and Sebastian is no newcomer to the world of containers, um, also to the world of open source. Hear a little bit about that from him in a bit, but his newest venture is OpsTrace, and that's what we're here to learn about today. How did OpsTrace start? Where did, where did this idea come from? You've done a lot of technical, you know, a lot of technological stuff in your life. How did you get to this point? What, what's the question that you're trying to answer? Cool. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, I'd love to jump. Uh, yeah, jumping right in. Awesome. So um, basically, um, my co-founder Matt and I got together because uh, we've always worked on infrastructure projects and helping making infrastructure easy. That's always been like wherever I worked in my past or he did, like the goal was making infrastructure easy. And when we got together, we decided that there were, we, we started researching other places that we wanted to help, right? Like uh, we interviewed a lot of companies and uh, we decided that observability was something that we also had seen that wasn't completely solved in a way that we would have liked, right? Like uh, we dialed in into calls with companies in our uh, past jobs where you try to help them, but they, they don't have the necessary tools set up to do it. Um, you, and uh, you, um, that, that's getting better and better. But we really wanted to, uh, uh, what we really loved were the open source tools to do observability. And those were the hardest, in our opinion, to use and to get people to deploy. Uh, and can I just stop so, you there? Because that's something yeah. that we talked about as well on Tuesday, talking about observability, is DX. And why do you think that with open source that it is such a rocky ground where it's not so easy to get into? So it comes from all sides. Alex touched uh, on very good points on uh, last Tuesday, where he talked about like the query languages and uh, the different ways that you as a user approach these things. Uh, and when as a user, like what can be complex and different, right? Learning new things, like uh, engineers building interfaces for themselves first. It's okay, that's how every software evolves. He talks a lot about this angle and we agree with that a lot, and uh, but thankfully, like there's a large group of a huge community, right, working on making these things easier. What we chose to tackle is the other end. In his presentation, one thing that he didn't talk about was the end of okay, if you want to use open source tooling, you got to set it up. You got to pay experts. He touched on it a little bit, but like uh, so, either you can, of course, you can use SaaS, right? Like uh, that's that's always a given. But if you want to use these open source APIs like Prometheus, uh, and um, he he mentioned. Uh, Elasticsearch and others, like you have to set all that up and you have to pay experts to do that. Or you have to learn to be an expert. It's okay, many people can do, but it comes at a cost of not doing something else. And so that's the angle that we chose to approach. We start from the bottom up, automating things that are very complex uh, to administer over time, right? And not just installation, but I'll talk about it later, but the maintenance over time as well, right? We have more plans than that. We also have more features than that, how to bring it accessible, but that's where we started. Yeah. Okay, and OpsTrace as a company, how old are you? Oh, we're a young company. We're uh, we're we're like uh, we're we're not even like we started in two thousand nineteen. Uh, so Matt and I got together. We were lucky to go through Y Combinator in summer two thousand nineteen, and that our, the idea came about in that summer. Uh, like, uh, and then uh, we got together. We're now a small team of uh, people around the world uh, in New Zealand and Europe uh, to. Um, that are working on this. Basically, expert engineers that are passionate about automating uh, complex um, solutions in software. In this case, we chose observability because we think, and I'll get a bit into it in my presentation, we think that this is something that is needs quite a bit more automation than other things if you want to get it right, right? There's like, there's legions of people on call for these things at SaaS providers or even at like for, for, for enterprise software, right? right? Like, so how do you reduce that? How do you leverage the technologies that have been built over the last decade and even the last few years, uh, like Kubernetes, uh, cloud provider automation to create a service that 
you you can give to more people, right? Like, and these people don't have to uh, to 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 learn how to manage it and can focus on their pieces. So think of it as the old school appliance model, but like I don't know if it ever really worked, if they were ever really that easy to use. But the idea is this is one of the pieces that you can put into your system where you don't have to worry about it. Like just like people do today when they buy SaaS. Uh, mm. this is, um, yeah. Good. So speaking of get into it, let's get into it. Let's see your screen. Awesome. Let's go for it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I'll share my screen. Hang on a second. Just needs a few seconds every time I share. Oh, All right, there you go. Good. Yeah. Okay, I'll move this to the side here. Okay, so um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Opstrace, why we built it, uh, why it exists, what our goals are, and uh, why this is an open project that we're hoping uh, people join and uh, contribute to. Uh, so the um, the main thing uh, here to start with is uh, I started with a website. I'm going to go through a couple of tabs, and I'm also going to be doing a, a small demonstration of how to use what's already there. Um, so uh, the, the website is in constant evolution, but our ideas are you should be able to deploy your monitoring system into your network, and you should be able to keep the data in your network, and you should be able to do this at a cost that is completely manageable. That means that, uh, what does manageable means? Well, it depends. Uh, on one hand, you have, um, uh, when you want to monitor something today, you can go to, uh, to uh, software as a service providers and pay for every byte you send them. That's great because you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do any work uh, uh, except hooking up your system to it, which is quite a bit of a learning curve still. And then uh, you, uh, uh, if you don't want that, if you don't want to be, if you want to have more control, if you want to use uh, CNCF type software like Prometheus and others, you have to do it yourself. That's fine too, but you have to build it and uh, administer it yourself. We decided to strike a middle ground and say, you can automate these things and this can run completely automated uh, within your network. So we started this, uh, me, uh, me, and my co-founder Matt. Uh, I, I, hope I should use this to show the pictures, but uh, uh, we met at Mesosphere, where we had already started trying to automate another technology uh, with other people called Mesos. Uh, like uh, we, it's it was a fun ride, even if we bet on the wrong horse. It was uh, in terms of Mesos being the technology uh, that was uh, we chose. Uh, it was great to learn to simplify very hard and complex systems. So that's where we met and. Uh, uh, after meeting there, uh, we kind of continued to like discussing things like how do you make infrastructure easy? How do you bring infrastructure to other people, right? So uh, we decided to work on this project. At first, it was meant to be a software as a service product, but that runs inside of the companies uh, of another company's network. But over time, we, th we, we saw that we were building this on the shoulder of giants. Giants that are other open source projects, whether it's the databases that we use to store the data called Loki and Cortex, which are built by Grafana Labs, or whether it's Kubernetes itself uh, that we use to automate everything. So we decided that a better approach uh, was to look at what GitLab was doing and build something that is truly open, that anybody can use, anybody can contribute to, and find a way to monetize that uh, instead. Uh, it's um, so we launched it. We uh, we we built it uh, with uh, with our small team, and we launched it in December. Uh, this is what I'm showing here, uh, and we launched it uh, so that uh, people can start using it, trying it out. It's a very early product. Uh, like uh, the you can, it's an early access. You can try it out yourself. Uh, you can build it yourself, and we also uh, manage it for people. So uh, uh, people can pay us uh, for us to manage it for them for now. And the goal here is to continue to develop that and make it something that uh, is really brings automation off uh, observability to anyone. So people should have to just worry, just like when they use a SaaS provider, they should just worry about hooking up agents to send their data and not just having to learn how to scale uh, the entire infrastructure behind that. That has a couple of advantage. If you do it this way, uh, th there, there are some really, really great advantage. The main one is cost. 
If you use a software as a service provider, you have to pay for every data that you send to them. Uh, so every byte uh, you have to pay because it's normal. They're storing it for you. So since they're storing it for you, it comes with certain constraints. Constraints of cost, constraints of retention, how, how much do you want to keep, how much do you want to send. This, these are things that can be alleviated if we leverage technologies like, for example, um, uh, distributed Prometheus, uh, the one that we use called Cortex, uh, if you leverage those technologies, you can actually store this data in your own S3 buckets, in your own GCS buckets, instead of sending them to uh, your, uh, your, your cloud provider. What does that bring you if you do it yourself, if you, if you, if you, if you put it in, the, in your own system? Well, it's about 10x cheaper. Uh, at least that's what you think it would be. It's not because you have to pay engineers to do it. You have to actually or buy a solution that does it for you. But there is a way, there's a gap somewhere that if technology can automate this enough, you can gain on that margin. You can have less engineers, probably even almost no engineers to manage something like a monitoring system. When I say no engineers, it's of course quite utopian. I mean by that that enough, the system is instrumentized and tested enough so that you can trust it when you're upgrading it, when you're maintaining it, when you're switching to the next uh, versions. So that's what we did. We, we're, we're focused on automating it. Everything that is testable is automatable. So we invested quite a bit into automating and into uh, testing this infrastructure. How do you make sure that from one release to another, it's not going to break? How do you make sure that your uh, data is still going to flow through and you're still going to get your alerts? That's what we're building or aspiring to build. So um, uh, I'll pause a bit here, uh, to, uh, but uh, in the explanations, I mean, I'm going to move a bit more to showing uh, what we've built uh, today. If anybody has any questions, feel free to like uh, write them in the chat. Okay. One right. thing I wanted to ask um, is, um, in terms of the, the kind of customers that seem to be dealing with these kinds of problems, is it any particular sector that you're encountering or companies at a certain, we could say, maturity level or what kind of issues do they seem to be having where you can say, hey, it's probably a good idea to talk to us? Mm -hmm. So when you're small, when you're just starting, it's actually easier to just use SaaS because it's cheaper, right? Like uh, you're going to send a little bit of data to them and it's not going to be too expensive. Where it starts getting interesting to try to do it yourself or to use something like OpsTrace So when you start doing moderate size infrastructure. And what's moderate size? Already at about a million active series in metrics. So that means unique unique data points going through your system. Uh, uh, if you already do this uh, per, like, uh, and you have these unique series, let's say, pulling every 30 seconds or every minute out of your system, already there, it's interesting to use a system like this because it's 10x cheaper, right? In terms of storing it. Uh, at least that's where we're going. Uh, and uh, what we do for people uh, today is we manage it for them in their own accounts. So that's what OpsTrace, the company does, right? Like uh, mm. uh, we, 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 t we, we run OpsTrace in somebody else's accounts and we manage it for them. So they don't have to be on call. They don't have to, uh, they don't have to wake up if the breaks, they just have to consume the data and, and uh, use the system. The, our goal is to make this something where we have this managed service, but people can trust doing it themselves with the open source version, right? Like, uh, uh, and uh, like, we're quite transparent about this. Like, Rome wasn't built in a day. You, you have to like really go at it methodically and uh, transparently. And this, that's why we're, we're exposing ourselves so early uh, on this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like you and said, so, yeah, the type of customers. Yeah, as soon as you have a certain moderate amount of load, but you're not big enough to be able to pay. For enterprise solutions, I mean, you could go to to like uh, Grafana Labs or Splunk or like there there are many great solutions out there. I don't mean to sp like they're awesome, but they're very expensive. And so either you're uh, you you use a cloud provider and you decide how much you're going to pay and how much you're willing uh, to do, or uh, you basically um, build it yourself. Right, that's the other solution. Uh, mm -hmm. But build it yourself, like I said, requires a lot of expertise, uh, which is fine. Like uh, some people love that expertise, right? Like some people love to build things themselves. Uh, we're trying to strike a middle ground uh, for the ones who want to focus on their uh, business, right? While still using open source software. Uh, mm -hmm. 
But like you said, it's not that, you know, it's, it's one size fits all. It's, there's got to be a, a good sense of matching of what, what folks out there are willing, what kind of work they're willing to put into, how much autonomy they're looking for, what they're willing to learn. Another thing that you mentioned about costs, because we've had a couple, of, a couple of people come on to talk about costs. And one of the recurring themes in all that is, you know, finding companies that are publicly willing to say we were burning, you know, millions and millions of dollars on, on infrastructure is not very common because then their investors will say, well, what were you doing with our money? Um, I, I just think that sometimes to get companies to be open about this, you find that that's challenging. Mm -hmm. ah, I, I, I find like if you talk to them one on one, they're quite open about how much they spend. Right. Like because uh, uh, it's 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 interesting. Infrastructure spend is huge. Right. Yep. And monitoring and observability while they are big numbers, they're actually a small piece of the entire infrastructure budget. So they're not always a priority. Right. Like even though they can go into the millions. Right. If there's millions of if there's millions of dollars of observability costs, usually there's even more <laughs> in others, right? Because they generate, you need a system to generate that, right? And so uh, we want to help reining in those costs and not uh, by giving them a system where they run this inside of their own network, it allows us to, to, to do uh, smart choices. Like for example, we since we don't since since the system Opstrace doesn't make money uh, like the company uh, doesn't make money on how much data flows to the system we're actually going to show people exactly how much the system costs right mm. inside of the dashboard we don't have this today this is a, it's a it's a roadmap thing but it's doable right because all the APIs are there you can go query them you can go say know exactly how much your metrics are costing costing and then you can put in the right limits the right things to help people control those costs and then understand what they want to observe and what not. Today, what people do to control their costs is way worse. What they do is they shut off metrics, they shut off logging, they they do these kind of things, right? Like, uh, uh, not everyone, but it's a very common thing. Uh, and so uh, that's what we want to counter is like, give people a way to know how much they're using, how much they're spending, like uh, how much data is flowing through this and make decisions upon it, right? And, and, and not just tell people, just send everything, it's fine. And then mm. people panic because the bill becomes too high and then like, like, like literally start shutting off uh, observability in certain systems. Not always in prod, right? The first, the, first, uh, the first casualty is always staging environments and stuff like this. <laughs> They're less well observed than their production counterparts. Uh, that's one example of casualties. Next casualty is access logs versus error logs, right? Like, and mm. so on and so on. Um, um, yeah. Okay, good. Let's keep going. Cool. All right, uh, so just uh, what I wanted to show here quickly is, uh, so what we focused on today, uh, up until today, is setting up an infrastructure and then uh, making sure that the, the infrastructure stays up over time. So uh, this is our quick start, the re uh, and I'm going to go through it in an accelerated fashion. You can do it yourself, it's quite easy, but like it takes time to set up the, for the cluster to come up, of course. Uh, there's a video if somebody wants to watch it in like a very short two minutes. Um, what's, uh, the way you launch an Opstrace cluster is that first, you're going to uh, want to download a CLI that we have, right? Like, so basically I'm going to copy this. Uh, I'm on Linux here, so I'm going to copy this. Can everybody, can, yeah, I think my terminal is yeah, big enough. Yeah, exactly. We might want to zoom in a little bit. Yeah. A bit more? All right, yeah. there you go, more, like this. Is that good enough? Yeah, just because somebody out there asked a question. Just let us know if you, if you want us to zoom yeah. in a little bit more and then we Here's, can. Here's, here, like uh, this is, if, if I need to zoom in more, I'll do it. Uh, so here I downloaded a CLI. This is how we work, right? Like uh, the Opstrace is built as a CLI and the CLI will basically deploy the entire infrastructure for you. Um, and so uh, in this case, I'm going to copy paste. Uh, I'm going to just follow the quick start and do an example, which is DOK uh, uh, 11 for today, March 11. And then uh, I'm going to copy this. I'm just copy pasting a few things. What, what I'm copy pasting here is, so we need, a small configuration, right? Like uh, uh, Opstrace, uh, thanks to uh, Opstrace is a multi-tenant system. You have you can have production uh, a production tenant, a staging tenant, uh, uh, and whatever tenants you want for different teams. Uh, and uh, so, in this case, we have a prod and a staging tenant. And then uh, I'm just going to start 
deploying the cluster. So in this case, it's AWS create, uh, create AWS, the, the name of the cluster in the config. Uh, this is quite quickly. Uh, now I'm going to get, a, so I'm going to get a, a, a prompt in my browser that I'm gonna qu quick through quickly explain what this is. So we create a domain name for you to help you. So by default, uh, one thing that you get is an opstrace.io domain so that uh, even though it's in your network, you have a nice domain name to send uh, your systems to. So what you see now going through uh, the system, what it's doing is it's setting up the entire infrastructure for the observability platform. Opstrace does not run on top of your existing Kubernetes or existing uh, infrastructure. What it does is it deploys the entire infrastructure in, a, in a, either a separate or in at least a separate VPC in your cloud accounts. Why? Uh, because when you're going to monitor something, you're going to want to monitor it from the outside. If your infrastructure goes down, you don't want the thing that's observing or monitoring your infrastructure to go down. You want to get an alert. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the, um, and the other reason we do it this way is that this is the way that we can test and automate the entire system. If we control the infrastructure from the bottom up to all the way when it's deployed, things are more automatable. Things are like, the more a system is the same for everyone, the more you can do this. And then here, what you see is basically the infrastructure getting set up. So we're quite verbose about what we do. Like for those who know, uh, like this, uh, for those uh, who, who know how this is, this is currently setting up NAT gateways, VPCs. And after, let's say 40 minutes or so on, on it's a bit quicker on, um, on um, um, GCP. Uh, you, you get this. Uh, so I'm going to start a full, sorry, I'm going to start, sorry. I'm going to just zoom in here a little bit on this one. Uh, so give me just a second here. Oh, and Hello. we did get a question as well, if you want to take that now. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so from Michael asking, um, you talked about Grafana being expensive, but the open source, uh, sorry, but the open source solution does it just as good. Jaeger is free too, so I'm really interested to see what would make me choose a solution. And then he also said, and what's the limits of the project out of the product? Is it fully horizontally scalable? What are the SPOF of any? What are the uh, what where the measurements get stored? Okay. All right. I'll try I'll try to answer them piece by piece. Give yeah. me just a second. Yeah, yeah no worries. So uh, the first thing is yes, open source software is great, but uh, the ones cited are not easy to use, right? Like to set up Grafana, setting up Grafana is easy. Uh, that's one of the easiest ones uh, uh, for sure. But then there, you need to set up backends for Grafana. Grafana by itself needs to query its data from somewhere, right? One of the one mentioned was Jaeger. Well, Jaeger doesn't work by itself. Jaeger actually requires a database to store everything in. One of the databases used for Jaeger is Cassandra. Cassandra so you see how far down the rabbit hole I'm going, right? Like this stuff is not easy to set up and maintenance. Even if it's free, it's not free in the time that people spend automating this, putting it together. And that's what we're trying to do, putting it together in an um, basically opinionated way, right? Um, when it comes to horizontal, uh, horizontal uh, scalability, uh, the... Uh, we use Cortex and Loki, which are uh, horizontally scalable, and we continue to design the rest of the system to be both vert like horizontally and vertically scalable, right? That, uh, that's the goal. Uh, and uh, the goal is to not have like a, a single point of failure as much as we can. Uh, like uh, we would have to audit again, but uh, we're, we're quite diligent about that. Uh, I'll, 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 uh, I can go into more details if needed, but I'll continue quickly here. Uh, so once a cluster is up, right? So I closed the other terminal because uh, it, like it was just starting the, uh, the system, but uh, once, uh, I, I minimized it, once a cluster is up, you have basically everything running and uh, everything running means uh, a cluster that you can log into. Uh, like, so um, in this case, it's this here. Uh, it's, this is a very sim simple UI that basically allows us to then go to different Grafana instances. So if, uh, for example, if, you, if you're familiar with what uh, uh, AWS has built uh, with uh, Grafana as a service and Cortex as a service, uh, this is an open source version of that. You have multiple instances of Grafana 
on demands that are set up, backed by a database, hooked up to backends, and ready to be used. Um, so uh, this is an example of one Grafana instance that's running in the system. Uh, you can see I'm uh, currently sending example data to it. Uh, basically, I have followed this quick start, and from my laptop here, I'm sending uh, some Prometheus data and some uh, logs to the system. Uh, and this is what I'm showing here. I like I'm I, like yeah, I'm not going to go too much into the details. This is just to show like some uh, example rates of logs and metrics going in. Uh, this is a very low rate, of course. Um, but the idea is to show that once everything is up, it's running, and you can start using Grafana as you used to, and you can start sending data very simply. Uh, like for example, in this case, if you're familiar with Prometheus, this is a simple Prometheus config. How do we get this Prometheus to send data to Opstrace? By adding a three-line configuration that I'm highlighting right now, basically. You give it a token. Uh, why? Because our uh, we are authenticated by default. We use TLS by default. Uh, like um, This is another thing that is usually not set up by default in open source projects. Authentication is a like exercise left up to the user. Uh, um, TLS is an exercise left up to the user. Uh, uh, so this is what we do by default. So Opstrace is then exposed. Uh, you can expose it on the internet by default, just like you would do a normal SaaS. You can also restrict it to your own networks if needed. But you get an easy URL that you can then put into your configurations and start sending data to. That's the level we want to get it down to so that uh, in terms of simplicity. Uh, what's running on top of this uh, uh, this cluster? Quite a few things. I'll um, uh, I'll, I'll get in, uh, into this a, a little bit later. Um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, yeah, that's it. I'll pause here for if there's any questions. Um, <clears throat> I think so far so good. Um, just what we had the other thing about you know horizontal scalability. I think you already covered that. Um, so yeah. I'm, right. I'm just I'm curious as well too. Is that in the design of all this? This was predominantly created by you and Matt, or other folks in the team as well? Oh no, other folks. So we're we're now uh, uh, me and Matt started right. So uh, interestingly, um, uh, in the early days, uh, Matt wrote quite a lot of uh, automation uh, to uh, like uh, our entire project is written in TypeScript because we wanted to have one language end to end to basically manage. Uh, the entire system. We use some Go uh, for like what we call the data path. That means mm -hmm. that where where the data flows through, right? Like the APIs, uh, things like this. These are written in Go. But the automation, uh, Matt wrote uh, basically used a lot of um, like um, inspired himself from uh, from uh, using things like uh, React uh, and and uh, the Redux Saga framework to build a basically. Uh, some a controller, so to speak, right? Uh, I, I, I used to evolve quite a bit in the world of Kubernetes operators, right? How do you m build code on top of Kubernetes that manages other pieces? That's what we've built, right? So we have uh, we have TypeScript types code to deploy the entire infrastructure. That's what you saw with the CLI that I ran. And then uh, t some other code gets deployed on top of the Kubernetes cluster that's launched, right? And then deploys everything and manages everything Opstrace in that cluster. And the cluster is dedicated to that. So if you go in and start manually killing thing, uh, the system will bring them back, right? Like uh, uh, that's that's how we're, we're 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 developing it. The system also is meant to uh, the controller is meant to manage upgrades as well, right? So uh, this is how you are supposed to upgrade the system. We are testing one version to another, and then uh, programmatically the system upgrades uh, and verifies, runs any migrations that it would have to run. We're still in the early days of that, but like uh, this, this, this was quite a bit of uh, that's the end where most of the work went into, right? Like uh, mm. having code that automates all of this, and uh, yeah, it was primarily started and written by Matt in the beginning. Now, of course, we're a team of uh, uh, seven, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, still growing. Uh, and then uh, uh, these are developers around the world that we've worked to, uh, before in the past, uh, and uh, who are basically passionate about this kind of automation, right? Like, mm. um, Good. We got a couple more questions. Um, first one: Do you have any dashboard template for SRE? That's something that we're uh, like we're we're still in the early days of, but that's uh, something that we're hoping to do by default. Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, this is an example. We have dashboards for the Opstrace system itself, 
right? So uh, uh, when you launch uh, ants, the Kubernetes the cluster, uh, the Kubernetes cluster that these upstrays that this upstrays. Uh, uh, instance launches on, uh, as well as the let's say like for example the 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 Loki and Cortex dashboards. So all the dashboards to ma to manage the system itself are there. But we still have a lot of works to do to f to to get a way to give people an easier way to integrate other people's dashboards. Right? Uh, this is Grafana. It's not easy to to create and and share dashboards. Everybody does them in different ways. It's an area that we'd love to look into and love to chat with other people. So we provide default dashboards for the system. Like uh, mm -hmm. let's say, for example, uh, I, I showed one, right? Like this yep. is, uh, I don't want to discard the changes of this one, but like uh, this is an example. This is the dashboard for the quick starts. We have a dashboard for the, the Kubernetes view. Uh, I'll, I'll just I'll just go in another tab. Give me a second. Uh, okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, this one is... An example, right? Like uh, uh, these dashboards. The beauty of this is we again use open source to get these dashboards, right? We use something called the uh, uh, the Kube Prometheus and the Prometheus operator project that runs within our pro uh, uh, within the Opsrey system, and it comes with a lot of dashboards to observe Kubernetes itself. So this is where we started, uh, but then uh, we kind of have a lot of plans to help with other dashboards, but I think you should get Matt on uh, for that one day. Uh, we will, we will get Matt on. <laughs> we got one more question before we keep going. Um, from, from Michael saying, I see Loki. So in internally you're using the Grafana open source suite, right? Is yeah. the tracing made with Tempo or is it made from the ground up? Cool. Uh, so uh, we don't, despite the ops race name, uh, we don't have tracing yet. Tempo is definitely something we're looking at because uh, it's uh, super interesting uh, since it follows the low key and cortex principles. We chose, so one of the fundamental principles when we started was how do we build a system that stores all its data in S3? Why, uh, this was one of the important things in our systems. We looked at Thanos, in the beginning we, we liked it a, a lot, but then we saw that cortex and Loki were, were going on a trajectory to really have everything in S3 without any Cassandra databases. We started try, uh, with Cassandra backends, but it's just too expensive. Uh, the, um, so uh, Cortex and Loki definitely uh, helped us uh, for that. And uh, we, that's what we automated around. And eventually uh, Tempo, uh, if, if it's the right choice, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do something for tracing because we have to choose a tracing solution. I explained the problems with Jaeger before, love what Jaeger is doing, but we need to find a solution that stores everything in S3 or GCS because uh, that's what's in the end quite cost effective, especially in terms of retention. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Let's keep going. All right. Um, roadmap. So what are we building on top of this? Uh, quite a lot, actually. Uh, so we talked about automation, but building an open source uh, platform for people is more than just assembling different open source uh, pieces and automating them. You need to have some coherent way to assembling everything together. Uh, I'll highlight a couple that we've been working on and are, are uh, actually releasing very uh, soon, right? Like one of them, for example, is uh, CloudWatch and Stackdriver collection. So uh, that one is uh, uh, quite cool because uh, what what it allows you to do is, so despite y y CloudWatch and Stackdriver are the uh, metric solutions used by both uh, AWS and GCP respectively. And what uh, you want to be able to do is some met some data is only in there. That's the only place that's in there. So when you use a service like Datadog, uh, you can actually configure it to go scrape, to configure the agent to go scrape CloudWatch and Stackdriver information. We wanted to bring this in a very easy way to do it, right? Uh, right? And so what we did is we created a simple API uh, that's, uh, sorry, this is the next thing I'm talking about. A simple XP API where you can configure OpsTrace by posting and we will have a feature announcement in a blog post about it. But simple API where you can post simple uh, stack driver or uh, CloudWatch exporter configuration through an API for each individual tenant to start scraping those information. So, for example, uh, if you like, uh, we use this to scrape information about uh, build kites, which is our uh, CI system, into uh, OpsTrace and Prometheus. So, this is how you can bridge things 
uh, together from other systems and how you can have a central ops trace cluster getting information from different cloud providers. Uh, what's new here is that we put this behind simple APIs, uh, just like uh, Cortex and Loki put things like the alert manager behind simple APIs. Uh, so that's uh, quite exciting, something that we're, uh, we're going to announce. The other thing that we've been doing that we've done is we want to help people try it out. And we, we built a, a Datadog compatible HTTP API. So lots of information is not necessarily Lots of people don't use Prometheus. Lots of people use other systems. The Datadog agents allows you to get quite a lot of information uh, out of the system uh, quite quickly. And lots of people will need time to migrate things over to open source solutions. This is a bridge uh, to help this. And it's an example of what we want to be able to do with OpsTrace, where we actually are not that opinionated about the amount of APIs we support, as long as people have a use for it and want to send uh, uh, data to the system. So yeah, you can, uh, you can check it out. You can, send, you can just send your data to, uh, with the Datadog agents to the Opstray system, and then you can query it with Grafana and uh, in, inside of, um, with Prometheus queries. So, um, and uh, I talked about uh, eventually putting a total cost of ownership detailed in the UI. I'll, uh, we talked, touched a bit on tracing. Oh yeah. so. Uh, why don't we have tracing yet? Just we wanted to focus on the pain points that people had today. And based on our chats with people, it was clearly still in the logging and monitoring, even though tracing is not far behind. Like uh, uh, it's something that we'd rather take our time on, uh, uh, especially in the, uh, in the advent of things like Tempo and others coming and uh, we have uh, choices to be made. But, uh, um, and then last piece that we were building on, uh, and the last piece I'd like to talk about of examples that we want to build on top is things like synthetic monitoring. It's a weird name, but it means like basically ping them, right? Like ping your site from multiple places in the world to make sure it's up. Uh, that is something that uh, you can do with a system with different SaaS providers, and uh, you can pay, uh, pay them for this. We'd like to have this as open source as well, uh, utilizing the, the, the customer's cloud infrastructure, right? Like, uh, so yeah, these are just a few examples. Um, we can do more, like for example, um, um, Prometheus is, uh, since Prometheus is running in every single tenant in our system, we will enable some APIs to help configure it from the outside and be able to go scrape other things like Azure and everything that it basically supports in terms of service discovery. Uh, so that's quite exciting, uh, creating one system and then giving people simple APIs to uh, be able to uh, configure it once and for all. Uh, so that's the next steps where we're going. So yeah, um, I'll uh, stop here. Uh, Good, yeah, we got, we got a question. Do you support data scrubbing to hide sensitive information for compliance with PCI? So uh, this is one of the reasons we chose to build ourselves on top of one, two, re two things we chose. One, why we wanted uh, a, to build a system where no data goes outside of the customer's network or the user's network, because that's the first rule of many PCI and compliance systems, right? If you keep it in your network, things are already easier. Then you still need to be able to scrub it. That's things that are getting implemented in systems like Cortex and Loki to be able to go and delete series and delete logs. Uh, it'll, it'll take some time until these things are mature, but uh, they, they'll work out. And then, yeah, there'll be APIs to delete data. But just by the fact of keeping the data in your network, you're already like a step ahead, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to call your vendor and then trust that they delete it. You trust because, of course, they went through certifications. It's not just like bullshit, of course. But you still have to trust that it's done timely, right? Like you need to get back to your customers. If you're in, ideally, you don't have to say anything because it never left your network, right? It mm. never stayed. It always stayed inside. Yeah. You feel that there's a knowledge gap though when it comes to data governance, or that maybe some people aren't up to speed to really understand what it means to have the ownership of the data. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, it, the ownership of the data, it goes, the, first of all, like if you have the data in open APIs that you can utilize, right, in things like your own S3 buckets, you can actually build software to go exploit it if you need to and, and use it if you want to use very, have very specific questions that nobody else will answer, right? Like uh, if you use a, a, a SaaS vendor, you have to code something against their proprietary APIs. The other idea is that 
if you keep the data where it is in your system, you get to decide on the retention, right? Uh, retention and syst the, uh, uh, the, the, the databases we chose, like Cortex and Loki, are built to be able to retain data for a long time, right? Like, uh, uh, and, and, like, uh, and uh, in a way that's very cost effective. So you get to decide what you want to keep, how much you want to keep, Right, and uh, you can observe much more if you do it in your network because you can send a lot of data and then filter afterwards. Okay, this kind of data I want to keep only for so long. This one I want to keep for uh, like forever. Some security mm -hmm. logs are forever, uh, but they're cheap to keep forever, right? Like, uh, um, so uh, that's the idea. Is if you the th new things you can do once one data is cheaper to keep and to inside of your own boundaries, right? Uh, without mm. sacrificing the ease of use. Uh, so, and we're a long way from that, like, and we're transparent with that. We're, we're, this is all aspirational, but there's nothing like technically impossible into building a platform like this, if you want, right? Again, it's testable, so it's automatable. Uh, the, 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 it's, uh, one of our engineers put it a bit like a signal processing uh, problem, right? You have different shapes of data for different customers and users going in, and you need to build a system that is able to adapt to these different shapes uh, of data, right? And it doesn't need to be perfect for all use cases, right? Like you mm -hmm. start piece by piece. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why it's, yeah, it's fascinating to, to be doable. Why waste time like rebuilding the same things over and over again, right? Or pay a lot of money if we can try to build this, right? Like, and there's no, uh, we're, we're so lucky that basically all technologies are coming together to be, allow you to build something like this, right? Every, everything is programmable. All the APIs are callable. Like it's a ton of work. You need to know things about all kinds of things, like at every level, right? Kubernetes databases, uh, what's, which open source project to trust, to follow, which are the right communities to invest in. But that's what we're, uh, that's what we love doing, right? Like, uh, and yeah. I'm, I'm sure others love doing that too. I think, I think it is common is that like, as much as there's sort of the pressure and stress, it's extremely exciting to have been in an environment that's so dynamic. And, um, you know, when we were talking with Jim Boguadia from Caverno, he was saying about how, you know, hopefully, or I don't know, Maybe it's possible that in the next few years that Kubernetes, this space will become, you know, more predictable, more boring. Whether it does or whether it doesn't is to be decided. But what it means right now is that there's a lot of, I would just say, it's very, very dynamic. Absolutely. And I hope that, like, it, this has nothing to do with observability. Just in general, I hope that, like, people, like, and I don't just hope. I know, like, the way things are going, people are just building APIs on top of APIs to make things easier mm. and not have to know all the intricate details of how a platform works right it's a it's a it's a it's like the serverless movement right like you call it whatever you want in the end it's about people just want to program and stay on their programming flow like and that's like we're we're trying to help in the uh, observability side others are trying to help in other places and we're also not the only ones but keeping people in their flow and be productive and like all focused on the things that they give a shit like about like mm -hmm. That's super important, and I hope that like we can continue to go towards there. And and again, it's not just hope. This is where things are going. Luckily, like yeah. So yeah, but I think at the end of the day, it's interesting too because we can talk about all the the technological depth that you've been that you've been mentioning. But at the end of the day, like you said, it's focus, more comfort. You know, these more human elements about being able to do your job more effectively, feeling more secure and confident about how you're doing things, and knowing that you're delivering better value to your customers as a result. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. yeah, that's good stuff. Absolutely. You mentioned the serverless thing because that's that's been I've been I've been hearing a lot about that. Um, do you find that to be particularly disruptive compared to other technological movements that are going on right now? I, it's one of them. Yeah, I mean, like uh, uh, it's it's fast. Like again, everything that brings you to a place where you don't have to know about nodes and things like this is like, why would you want to know about nodes, right? <laughs> like, uh, like uh, seriously, like it's bo it's boring, it's tough. It's like, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that today you have the luxury to forget about them, but like, is there things that are technically impossible to get there? No, like uh, it's just a lot of like, think of it as a huge tree of, possible solutions and branches and people trying and sometimes they converge, sometimes they die, right? Like, uh, uh, but like, I think serverless, uh, like despite the hype in the name or everything, 
is where people want to be, like, or at least some people, maybe not everyone. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be everything for everyone. And that's what, that's why we try to like uh, talk about Upstrace as something that is like, you don't worry about like how it's running and the nodes that it's running on, right? Like you just worry about APIs and data that you're sending into and uh, that's it. Like, uh, yeah. um, and so, yeah. Regarding Upstrace, what are the most frequent questions that you seem to be getting right now? Oh, uh, the ones that were asked already? Why no, 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 I'm just, thing? yeah, th those, are, those are quite frequent when you, when you show, you know, the sort of ins and outs of how things are working. Yeah, so those are quite frequent today. One big question is, of course, like, hey, like, uh, how, like, okay, you're, 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 you're putting it all together and you're creating a cluster, and then what? And, uh, and like, uh, what we're trying to educate about is, like, no, we're not just putting the cluster together. We are actually building a system that keeps the cluster up. Uh, right, like, uh, uh, and then uh, and then we want to build, use that base to build on top of it and deliver functionality. So we get the question that we get a lot that we're still working on is explain the value proposition well, right? Like, uh, uh, and then uh, other questions. Uh, I mean, you have a lot of typical questions, right? Like, uh, uh, like uh, why don't people build it themselves? Like, and then you educate that it actually costs money to build things themselves, right? Like, mm. open source is. F not free in terms of knowledge you need to acquire people or people you need to pay to acquire that knowledge or experts you pay that already have acquired that knowledge, right? So we get that question a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, these are the kind of questions like, so it's very educational. It's like, oh, like, how do you, like, basically convincing somebody that they can do certain things that they've been doing, but they can start thinking about doing them differently, right? Like, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and, and once again, that's it's a frequent conversation that we have is the you know what mindset is necessary in order to get into this. Um, what do you need to be open to? What changes are you willing to make? Who are the stakeholders that are going to be involved? One thing that you were mentioning earlier is that for some folks, like in in maybe more traditional roles or in certain companies where things have been done a certain way for a long time, they start hearing the word automation, and that's synonymous for my job is going to disappear. Um, so there's like there's a certain amount of tension that gets raised about it. It's like, no, it means that you'll be able to focus on other things and be able to look for other pieces of the puzzle where you can be providing value. Um, have you noticed a similar thing regarding automation? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll be a bit more radical in this. For mm -hmm. most DevOps people that you talk to today, right, or engineers or whoever you want, whatever you want to call them, uh, sorry, it's automation. And when somebody comes and say, oh, we're going to automate this, like, it's synonym synonymous with bullshit. It's like, what? <laughs> you're going to what? Like, you're going to automate this, but no, and this is complicated. And it's true because a lot of times, like, it's over-promise, under-deliver, right? Like, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, because certain things are not, like, magical, right? Like, there are, there are hard problems, and sometimes things are not that easy to understand. So this is why we're, like, in our hand, like, uh, uh, we're taking the pragmatic approach of saying, be transparent, show what, show when it's hard, explain, go at it piece by piece. It's not going to be full, like uh, fully automated from the beginning, but uh, at least it's like, we're going to build rails to help with that, right? The first rails being testing. Uh, testing mm. is like, testing is like, testing, is, I didn't even talk enough about testing about how important it is for this, right? You take all this open source software and you build on top of a stack, on top of cloud providers, different cloud providers, you need to have make sure that it all works together and at all times. And that's what people who assemble infrastructure themselves don't do, right? They assemble the infrastructure, they install the software, but do they test it in a repeatable way all the time? No, not really. Like they deploy the new version. Of course they have alerts, they have things. Our We're zooming in on one little piece that's actually quite big, which is monitoring. And we're saying this one, this piece we're going to test, this piece we're going to automate by testing it, by making sure that it's covered, right? I like this is uh, goes back to this uh, like signal processing thing. Uh, it's like once you collect enough shapes of data, uh, like you can actually test it again and again and again and again, right? Like this is not some black magic where like things are going to change, right? Like uh, you can actually, like it's costly, but that's a bet that we did as a company, right? I talked a lot about the open source side, but as a company, we're going to invest in this testing infrastructure since we're not going to be hosting anyone, right? We're going to be running it in the people's accounts. So uh, uh, you, you, this is how we're going to 
uh, try to do it. So we'll we'll write more about testing because uh, this is something people underestimate um, in terms as, of like as an integral part of this entire process. And that you know we live in an age where it's uh, out of the box, plug and play. You know, that everything's just automatically. And like you said, being transparent and saying there is a process behind this. These are the results that we're that we're saying that are going to happen, but. Um, but that it's not just something that's, that's overnight. Like you said, this sort of black magic thing of like, you know, fix it, make it Exactly. Yeah. Good. We got a couple more questions. Um, as I understand, the, the template gets deployed on Kubernetes. Um, is it EKS or native on ECT, uh, ECT uh, 2S? Sorry. Are you planning yep. to support serverless and especially uh, Fargate? And how much effort do you think it would take? Cool. So we... Uh, at first, we made a choice of supporting two cloud providers, right? We wanted it to work at, at least at GCP and AWS. Why? Because going from two to more is easier than to go from one to, to more, right? Like if you just support one cloud provider, it's going to take you a long time to go to more. To, that doesn't say that going from two to more is easy. Uh, it's not, but it's there's more things have been thought of, right? Like to make sure that it's, again, worked and it's also constantly tested on those two providers. On those providers, we did choose to use the native Kubernetes implementations. So EKS and um, uh, EKS and uh, GKE respectively for AWS and GCP. Why we chose that is because again, we don't want to invent things that have already been invented. So maybe there will be a great open, there are great open source Kubernetes implementations or distributions that could be used right? Uh, instead, maybe. But for now, we focus on those two. Impl going towards running this on, like, so it deploys its own Kubernetes cluster, and it deploys itself on top of it. So going to another system, like running this on Fargate things, we'll have to see. I don't know. Uh, we, uh, it's definitely complex, uh, like, uh, but it's, it's not undoable. Google has announced a very interesting thing, which is uh, they uh, and and Fargate is a bit trying to be the same thing, which is like Kubernetes without nodes, right? Talking mm -hmm. again about the serverless thing, the nodes are there, but you don't know. You just tell them how many pods you want to run at what size. We have not looked into how to run ops trace on that and what the price implications are and how it's different, right? Like we, EKS is probably the most advanced thing that we use in the in the in the AWS cloud provider. Otherwise, we use networking S three, uh, like the the basics, right? Like uh, uh, so yeah, it'll uh, all that uh, we thought about it. This is what we support and how we built it. Yeah. Okay. And one more question after that: being multi-cloud, I'm also interested to know if you plan to support other platforms like Azure. Yeah. So that one is definitely like we don't know when it'll be on uh, based on demand, right? Like uh, right now, our demand has been AWS and GCP. So this is what we've been doing. But this system is made to work on both. The good thing is you don't necessarily, like even if your stuff is running inside of Azure, you don't necessarily have to run ops trace in Azure, right? Might even be a good advantage if you're willing to pay for the egress, ingress, egress costs, uh, the advantages that, which you do anyways, when you send it to somebody like Datadog, right? Like uh, uh, then you have it in a different cloud. So if Azure goes down, you still have your monitoring up. It's an extreme case, but you could think of this as different AZs, different uh, regions as well. So you can observe clusters on Azure with OpsTrace today, but you cannot run OpsTrace on Azure yet. But based on interests, eventually, like uh, if somebody says, hey, we're willing to pay you to do this, of course. Right? Not going to say no. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like you said, it's just kind of a question of waiting for that use case to come up. When it does, you'll respond to it. But once again, exactly. this is exactly. This is a company that was started in 2019, so you know we've got we got a ways to go. Um, exactly. You know, other things that you mentioned as well too, because you were talking about storage. In terms of the uh, open source options that are out there related to storage, is OpsTrace working with one in particular or another? Yeah, we only chose specifically to use uh, Cortex for metrics uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Loki uh, for logs. Uh, why? Because of this fundamental principle from the beginning, which was. We want the system to be horizontally scalable, right? Uh, uh, we want it in, in all terms, right? Querying, uh, writing, uh, being able to separate these paths, all of that. Uh, and we want it, the data to be only in S3. And so that's the, like, these are the two best, at least in our opinion, after testing a lot. And especially, like, we looked at Thanos in the beginning and everything, but, like, we actually... 
Thanos is an, an alternative uh, to, to kind of Cortex. It works in very different ways, uh, to be honest. But Thanos is actually used by, like these two communities work together, and is used by Cortex as the backing engine to store everything mm. to S3. Uh, the, and this is the backend that we're using. So it, open source is a very big intermingled way of people working together. There are other solutions out there. There are other metrics platforms. Maybe there are others that are pure S3, sure. Mm. But these are the ones that we chose because of we trust that the community is going in the right place. Like there are like it's great people working on it. We saw like how they were dedicated to making sure that it works like without any other database, right? Like uh, when we started, it, it these things were only able to use Cassandra and uh, uh, and Dynamo at least partly. This has changed, right? Because the community like and uh, has invested in making sure that it's stored only in S3. So yeah, we wanted to have that. Uh, we this was important for us because once things are in S3, it's easy to manage, easy to like just have data get deleted over time, right? The cloud does it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we chose them, and uh, partly we'll do a blog post about why we chose them uh, and uh, what drove us to to that. And are you writing the blog post? Is that, I mean, uh, I mean, is it, not it, just it, me. Like, okay, uh, everybody's so kind of contributing. Everybody and, yeah. on the team. No, 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 yeah. So we're like, we're gonna. Our next blog post will be about these exporters and how to monitor CloudWatch and uh, and uh, and and Stackdriver. And we could add Azure if there was demand. That's an easier one to add versus because mm -hmm. uh, it's just monitoring another cloud. Uh, that's the next blog post we're gonna do. Uh, uh, that's not me. That's Nick who's on our team. And then uh, I, uh, my next blog post is. Uh, this one, which is why we chose Cortex and Loki. So it's kind of time, timely. So no, the entire team does this. Uh, we, uh, we're we going to ramp up communication and education a bit more now, uh, like uh, in our, uh, on our end. So Very we've good. been building a lot. Yeah. I mean, a small team, short period of time. We got to keep a lot of different factors in mind, obviously. Yeah. Good. Um, we're getting just about to the end. We do have one more question for Michael, but Michael, I would recommend get into Slack, uh, get into our Slack. We can take the conversation there. Oh yeah. Uh, um, uh, I would say on a personal level, all the correspondence I've had with Sebastian has been very, very easy. Um, he's a very accessible person as you've seen in this meetup, very open to questions and, and sharing his opinion. Um, before we finish though, Gorka, can we, um, can we share my screen? So you may have noticed, so every time we have a talk, we have a graphic oh, wow. uh, recorder who's doing a visual thinking um, to represent all the different topics that were that were mentioned. Um, so hopefully he was able to touch on everything. There was a That's lot awesome. of stuff being covered. Um, so yeah, we always have Angel helping out to give a visual representation of things being mentioned. Um, thanks to everyone who asked questions. There were some really good questions, very dynamic. Um, Sebastian, is there any other info you want to leave in terms of Twitter? You have a very cool Twitter name, by the way. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> you got you got four letters. That's that's, that's okay. It. Uh, it's yeah. just I'm Sebastian Val, so Seb P. I wanted Seb, but that was gone, right? Like, yeah. Uh, of course, Seb is always gone. Uh, yeah. One thing about Twitter, uh, I loved what Alex did, and I'll do the same. Like putting his Calendly in 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 this. Uh, so I'm going to do this right after I hang up yeah. because I think that's cool, and so uh, uh, I'll do the same. I'm actually going to talk to Alex tomorrow, and I may have to talk to you as well later on. So I'll be awesome. looking forward to seeing awesome. that. Yeah, I and booked he, some time with him because I loved what he was saying, and like, oh wow! Uh, so since he did, like, uh, for sure. And this thing, he's just—he's a super open person, just as you are. Yeah. So I think I think it's really really good because that way people can take some of these conversations a little bit further. Um, anyway, thank you very much. It was wonderful to have you. For everyone as well too, we will have three meetups next week. On Tuesday, we'll be with Ramiro from Octeto. On Wednesday, we'll be with Luke Feeney from Terminus DB. And on Thursday, we'll be with Tiffany um, from Harness. And on Friday, we're also going to have a meetup, but that will be announced next week on Monday. Anyway. I've met the Octeto guys. They're really awesome. So you should they are. definitely they are. check in. They are. And they have a very cool story about where their name came from. And uh, Ramiro is from Mexico. And their other three founders are from, uh, co founders are from Spain. Um, yeah. So hopefully, I'm hoping to geographically connect with them as, as, uh, as, I hear, as I'm here in Europe. Anyway, Sebastian, awesome. thanks a lot, man. Thank you, man. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.